All right, let's get started. Welcome, everybody. My name is Nate, and I'm going to be talking about OAuth and OpenID Connect today. Um, I work at a company called Okta up in San Francisco, and I do a lot of web security stuff and work on um, just making it easier for developers to do authentication and authorization in their applications. And so through talking to a lot of developers, um, I've noticed that a lot of people have, have heard of these protocols, OAuth and OpenID Connect, but a lot of people don't really know what they are, or maybe they understand them a little bit, but not, not really understand them fully. So just as a quick poll, who here has at least heard of OpenID Connect or OAuth? Awesome. What about, would you, would you feel like you're a, an expert on it, or you really understand the protocol at a, like a pretty good level? Not, not me, not me. Um, these are pretty difficult protocols to understand, um, especially for some reasons that we'll go into in a second. Um, there, there's a lot of confusing information about them online. So my goal with this talk is to just cut through kind of the, the jargon, cut through the technical speak, and try to explain how these protocols work just in plain. Um, try to just make it really easy to understand. And we are going to get into some of the technical stuff today because we have a little bit of extra time. Uh, but if you have any questions at the end, feel free to ask them. Um, I'll try to make it as easy to understand as I can. So what we're going to do first is we're going to talk a little, uh, kind of start with a little bit of history to come, because it's helpful to kind of set the stage and understand where these protocols came from and why they were built the way they are. And that'll inform kind of how, how we understand how they're supposed to be used today. All right, so if, if you're interested in the, the slides or the video from this talk, it's available. It'll be available on my Twitter at the end, at, at nbarbatini. Um, and if you want to follow my whole team, we tweet out a lot of good content like this. You can follow at Octadev. All right, so let's get started. Before we even talk about OAuth and OpenID Connect, I want to kind of set the stage and talk about the, the most basic type of authentication you could do on the web, the, the simplest case. I'm calling this like simple login, or sometimes it's called forms authentication. Um, and this is just a, a simple example of where you have like a email and password or a username and password form on a website. The, the user enters their information, and your backend website code is going to like go hit a database somewhere, look up, see if that username and password actually exists. If so, um, you know, Verify that the, the password matches, hopefully doing like password hashing to make sure we're not like storing the password in plain text, um, looking up that user's information, and then usually what would happen is um, the application would drop like a cookie into the web browser to keep track of the user and say, hey, this user already logged in, they're associated with this particular session ID or something, and we've logged the user in. Now, this is basically how authentication started out on the web. This is like a lot of people, including myself, cut their teeth on building this type of thing like in PHP or in my case classic ASP, some really, really bad code that I never want to look at again from like 15 years ago. Um, but you can do this on your, on your web server if you want. Um, the, the industry has been moving a little bit away from kind of doing this in a homegrown way and I'll explain why. So this doesn't have anything to do with OAuth yet, but I wanted to kind of set the stage for explaining what we're, what we're going to be comparing against. This is like the most simple use case. There's a couple of downsides of doing uh, authentication inside of your app, kind of like in a homegrown way, like I just described. The big downside is that when you do it that way, you're on the hook for all of the security and maintenance that goes around with maintaining an authentication system. So if it's just your server code hitting a database somewhere and you know, making sure the user's password matches, then you have to be aware of like when the best practices in the security industry change around password hashing or storing user information securely, or you have you know HIPAA coming down the wire or now GDPR coming down the wire. You have to be aware of like how these things change. And there's quite a bit of maintenance involved in making sure that your authentication system is still working. So at risk of giving away the punchline just a little bit, OAuth 2.0 and OpenID Connect are kind of some industry best practices that the industry as a whole is moving towards to try to make this problem a little bit easier to solve. But I'm getting a little ahead of myself, so let's explain what, how these protocols work and what they are first, and then I'll come back to that. So I want to acknowledge that there's a ton of really confusing information about OAuth online. If you try to Google what is OAuth, or how does OpenID Connect work, or how do I use OAuth 2.0, you're probably going to find extremely confusing information. When I started learning about this a couple years ago when I got into like the web security space, um, it was really confusing for me too. And I still get confused sometimes, even today. I think the guys who wrote the spec still get confused as well. 
Um, the, the thing that you'll find online and why it's so confusing is that for mainly two reasons. There's a lot of terminology and jargon that's just like really dense, really obscure, and like really just like very OAuth 2.0 specific. So the problem is that if you are a newbie or you don't really understand how this works yet and you Google to try to figure out how it works, what you're probably going to find is a lot of information that, that talks to you as if you already understand all these terms, already understand all this jargon. Um, but if you don't know what those things mean, you have no idea what it's talking about. And that can be really confusing. The other thing that's really difficult when you're trying to learn this is that there's a lot of actually incorrect information online as well. So if you Google some of these terms, the most likely thing you'll find is probably like one guy's Stack Overflow post that explains how to use OAuth a certain way. And then the very next result will be like somebody else's blog post that says he's doing it wrong and you should really do it a different way. And then the third result is like an entirely different blog post that says they're both wrong and you should not do it that way at all because that's the worst thing to do. That's obviously really confusing when you're learning this. You're like, <laughs> who's right? Why, when we have a spec, which otherwise should be hopefully very, like, very concrete, why do we have so many different interpretations of like, how to use it? That's obviously, that doesn't happen with like, HTTP. There's like, one pretty correct way to use HTTP, and that's about it. But with OAuth, unfortunately, there's all this kind of wiggle room. There's a little bit of fuzziness in the spec. So that makes it really hard, too. I just wanted to kind of acknowledge that if you've ever felt confused or overwhelmed or, or intimidated by this stuff, you're not alone. Pretty much everybody has. My goal today is to try to make it a little bit less intimidating, a little bit less confusing. And you can let me know at the end if it, if it makes a little bit more sense. So let's go back in time. Let's take our time machine and go back in time about maybe 10 years, back to like 2006, 2007. Um, this is a long time ago, especially in internet years. This is a long time ago because Back in, say, 2006, we didn't even really have smartphones. That was like brand new with the iPhone, came out in like 07, I think. Um, so this is a long time ago. Back then, though, just like today, applications and websites had a number of different use cases that they might have to, to deal with in terms of like login, authentication, authorization. I'm just going to use the term identity as kind of like a catch-all term for like authentication, authorization, login, permissions, that type of thing. So if we look at the kind of common identity use cases from like 10 years ago, we have that simple login stuff, like I said, which you could probably just fulfill with like some uh, form and some cookies or something. Just login the user in with like a username and password. That's pretty simple. We also have um, some apps that need to do single sign-on or SSO. Um, and that was typically done with a protocol called SAML. And today it's still very often done with a protocol called SAML as well. Um, the SAML protocol is very good for this type of single sign-on use case, um, which is basically where you have one account in a system that lets you get log in or get access to a number of different systems. This is really common in like businesses where you have a single master account or you have like an Active Directory account or, or an employee account that lets you get into a number of different systems. Um, and SAML is the protocol that kind of makes that work under the hood. The, the SAML protocol works. It kind of has a reputation of being a little bit hard to work with as a developer because it's pretty, it's pretty obscure, even more obscure than OAuth. It's, it's very, um, very dense. Um, but it works, and it was used back then just like it's used today. There's a couple of new use cases that were just starting to come onto the scene about 10 years ago or so um, that, that were new, though. So one of them was mobile apps. Like I said, mobile apps, smartphones were brand new. The idea of mobile apps and app store was like brand new. Um, and so there was this whole new set of use cases where we want to be able to log into a mobile app, but you want to stay logged in you know, after you close the app, most likely. Um, how do you keep a, a, a long-lived session alive on a device? Um, do you use like a cookie that doesn't really work well on devices? It was, a, it was a new field. It was brand new. So we didn't really have a good solution for that right away. As well as something called a use case called delegated authorization, um, which probably sounds like the most boring academic thing you could imagine. Um, but this is actually what I'm going to focus on here. Um, delegated authorization is an interesting use case, which is also the genesis or where OAuth, the OAuth protocol, came out of. So despite sounding very boring, this is exactly what I'm going to focus on. So the delegated authorization problem is something that, despite sounding very boring, uh, something that you probably interact with maybe on a daily basis, even maybe today already, and you, don't even, you haven't even realized it. So this is essentially, who has ever seen the screen that says, um, hey, uh, this so-and-so app is trying to access your Facebook account. This will allow them to like, see your public profile and like, your birthday or something, but won't let this app post to Facebook on your behalf. Who's ever seen that screen? Or the same thing with Google or Twitter or whatever. That's a really common pattern on the internet now. 
Um, but it wasn't 10 years ago. It wasn't even around 10 years ago. That pattern where you get that pop-up or that prompt and you click yes and it allows, now you probably have like 15 weird apps that are connected to your Facebook account or something and you don't even realize it. That pattern is OAuth. So if you've ever clicked yes on that prompt, you've already used OAuth. You maybe didn't even know it. Um, but let's talk about why that was invented. Well, back, like I said, 10 years ago or so, there wasn't a good way of solving that problem. There were only bad ways of solving that problem. <laughs> this is a uh, kind of an infamous screenshot from the early days of Yelp, where Yelp tried to solve this problem, but they did it in a really bad way. No, no offense to them, they didn't have a better way of doing it, but at the time, um, Yelp did something that's pretty common. Uh, at the end of your registration flow, you said, hey, you just thanks for registering for Yelp. Uh, do you want to you know, spread the love, send a referral link or an invite link to all your friends so they can also sign up for Yelp? They were a brand new startup, so they're trying to get you know, as many people as possible to use their service. The way that they did it was they said, hey, give us your Gmail email address and also give us your Gmail password just in case you weren't clear about what they were asking for. They, it, it's kind of small here on the screen, but it says, in parentheses, the password you use to log into your Gmail email, just in case you weren't sure which password they wanted to, them to, for you to give them. Um, so what they're basically saying is like, hey, we'll log into your Gmail account for you. We'll grab all your contacts. We'll send them all an email. We will then um, log out of your Gmail account. We'll throw away your password. We promise we won't do anything evil with it. And then we'll go on our merry way. So in case you're wondering, this is really, really bad. You should not do this. You shouldn't build something that does this, and you shouldn't use something that does this with your Gmail. Um, because for many people, their Gmail account or their you know, Yahoo account or whatever their kind of main email account is, usually is the keys to the kingdom to a lot of other stuff they have. So your bank you know, password reset flow probably goes back there. Your Bitcoin, Coinbase password reset flow probably goes back there. Hopefully you have two factors set up on these accounts and stuff. Um, but this is just a really, really bad idea to, to just randomly give people your, your Gmail password, especially because back then, Yelp was not the big billion dollar company they are today. They were just like a startup that no one had ever heard of. So this is really bad. Like I said, I'm not trying to pick on them too much. This is just a really good example to illustrate what the problem was back then and how they didn't have a better way of solving it at the time. We have a better way of solving it now, and today we would use that OAuth flow that, that I just described before, you, where you get a pop-up and says, Yelp wants to get to your access to your contacts. Are you sure you want to allow this, yes or no? As a kind of an ironic side note, there's only one industry that still does this today. If you've ever used a tool like Mint or Betterment or any of those financial dashboard tools that like, let you aggregate all your bank accounts and you see them all in one screen, uh, when you set up your bank accounts, you have to give them your bank login and password to do that. And the reason is because banks haven't adopted OAuth yet. They're still using this really crappy old way of doing this. Um, so you know that your information is really secure when you do online banking, that's great. <laughs> so um, let's talk about how you would solve this problem, how banks should solve this problem, and how a company like Yelp could solve this problem with OAuth, basically the protocol that was invented to solve this problem. Basically, we're going to talk about it at a really high level, and then we're going to kind of progressively go down and talk about the lower and lower levels of how this works. Um, so we start with a user like me or you who says, like, okay, I trust Gmail. I maybe kind of trust this, this startup called Yelp. Uh, I, I'll trust them enough to let them have access to just my contacts, but I don't want them to, like, be able to delete my email or, you know, go look at my Google Photos on Google Drive or whatever. Um, so what we would do today is we would have a button on the application on Yelp or whatever that says connect with Google or authorize with Google or link or whatever. What, that ha what happens when the user clicks on that button or that link is the user is put into what's called sometimes an OAuth flow. It's basically the set of steps that ultimately results in the application being able to access that information or having the authorization to access that information. So we're going to look at this diagram like five times, and you're probably going to get really tired of seeing it. But this diagram is going to kind of illustrate at a high level how this works. So let's say the user clicks on that connect with Google button or link to Google button. What's going to happen is the user's browser is redirected over to a Google domain, accounts.google.com most likely. And at that Google domain, they're going to be prompted to log in. So probably enter email and password. That, that's at least a little better though, because now at least I'm giving my password to Google and not to Yelp or somebody else. So I should feel okay logging into Google. I can see that in the address bar, it's actually a Google domain that, that I'm being presented with. Assuming that I log in successfully, then I get a prompt that says, hey, this application, Yelp, is trying to access your list of things, public profile, contact, something like that. Are you sure you want to allow this? Yes or no? 
So the user explicitly has to consent to whatever they're granting access to. That's important so that you don't get tricked into like agreeing to something and you don't know what you're agreeing to. And then assuming the user clicks yes, they can always click no, in which case we're done, nothing else interesting happens. But if the user clicks yes, then the browser is redirected one more time back to the application, back to where it started, to a special place on the application called a callback or a redirect URI. I'll talk about that in a sec. And with a little bit of magic, that application is then allowed to go talk to some other API, say the Google Contacts API, and say, hey, normally I wouldn't have access to Nate's contacts, but I have this special magic thing that tells me that I'm allowed to have that now that Nate clicked that yes button. So there's still a little bit of magic in this diagram, but we're going to remove the magic in a sec by talking about all of the different OAuth terminology um, that goes into this. So here's a big, long bucket of terminology for you. In the kind of OAuth 2.0 landscape, um, side note, by the way, um, there is an OAuth 1.0, but we're not talking about that today because for all intents and purposes, it isn't used anymore. It's just kind of dead, deprecated. Nobody really uses it. OAuth 2.0 is used very widely on the internet today. Um, so in OAuth terminology, we have a bunch of terms and jargon that basically just renames things that we already have names for, which is kind of confusing. But we'll go through them all here. So in OAuth 2.0, we have something called a resource owner which is just a really fancy way of talking about you or me, the user who can click yes, who's actually sitting in front of the keyboard, who owns the data that the application wants to get to. So in this example that we'll keep using here, I have some contacts in my Google account. I am the resource owner of that data, and I am the person who can click, you know, yes, I allow this application to have access to this data. Um, the next term that we need to look at is something called a client. This is just a way to refer to the application. We've been using Yelp in this example. We'll just keep using Yelp. Yelp would be the client in this case, the, the application that wants to get to this data, basically. We also have something called an authorization server. The authorization server is the system that I can use to say, yes, I authorize this permission or I authorize this to happen. In this case that we've been using, this is a uh, accounts.google.com, where I can log into my Google account and click, yes, I consent, yes, I accept. Um, that's actually separate than the resource server, which is the API or the system that actually holds the data that the client wants to get to. So in this case, this is, we're going to call this the Google Contacts API. This is the system that actually holds my contacts. Sometimes the authorization server and the resource server are the same thing. Sometimes they're kind of together, melded in the same system, but many times they're separate. Um, so the whole point of the whole OAuth flow, going over to the authorization server, coming back to the client, um, the point of, getting, of doing that whole kind of dance back and forth is to get something called an authorization grant. And the authorization grant is the thing that's, that basically proves that the user has clicked yes, I, I consent to this level of permission, or I allow you to have permission to this stuff. I already mentioned this a little bit before, but um, the uh, when the authorization server redirects back to the client application, it kind of needs to know where to redirect back to. And that's sometimes called a callback, sometimes called a redirect URI. It's basically just, where should I end up at the end of this flow? If the user clicks yes, where, do, where does they need to go next? And I mentioned how the authorization grant is kind of the, the point of this whole flow. Well, at an even higher level, the, the thing that the client really needs is something called an access token. An access token is going to be the way, the key that they use to get into whatever the data that I granted access to or granted permission to on the resource server. So as you'll see in a sec, the client will eventually get something called an access token, which lets them go do what they need to do. So let's go through this whole flow again and add some of these terms in bit by bit. So we're going to start on the client with me, the resource owner, probably sitting on the client website, and I click on that connect with Google button. What happens is I get redirected over to this authorization server, which is accounts.google.com in this case, but it could be uh, the Facebook authorization server, it could be an authorization server hosted by Okta, it could be somebody else. Um, right at the beginning of this flow, as the client is redirecting over to the authorization server, it's already passing along some information, some kind of configuration information that the authorization server needs. So it's saying, hey, when you're done, assuming everything is successful, here's where I want you to redirect back to at the end. So we have to pass that redirect URI at the very beginning. We also have to give it some other information, such as what type of authorization grant do we want? There's actually a few different types of authorization grants, and I'll go into that a little bit later. In this case, we're going to use the most common kind of like 
simple example, which is what's called a code grant or the authorization code grant. Because we're requesting a code, this is sometimes called the authorization code flow, um, and at the end, as you'll see, we'll get a code. But I'm getting a little ahead of myself. So the authorization server then prompts the user, login, consent to that per level of permission, all that good stuff, redirects back to the place specified at the beginning, the redirect URI, and redirects back with something called an authorization code, because that's what we asked for at the beginning. Now, the client actually can't do a whole lot with that authorization code. Um, in fact, there's only one thing that the client can do at all with the authorization code, which is to go back to the authorization server one more time and say, hey, you just sent me this authorization code. What I really want is an access token. I can't really do anything with this code, but I want an access token. Can I exchange this code for an access token? And the authorization server is going to say, sure. Let me just make sure that code is still valid, is not been like forged, or you didn't make it up or something. Um, and it, assuming that's the case, the authorization code is still good, the authorization server says, OK, client, here's your access token. And then finally, the client can do what they actually wanted to do in the first place, which is go to the resource server, maybe contacts.google.com, and say, hey, I want to get to Nate's contacts. Now, normally, contacts.google.com would say, you can't have access to Nate's contacts. Who are you? But because the client is able to attach this access token to the request, then contacts.google.com is going to say, OK, normally I wouldn't let you have access to this information. However, you have this access token that proves that Nate said it's OK for you to access that information. Here you go. Now, if the client tried to do something else, like maybe not retrieve my contacts, but like go delete all my contacts, hopefully contacts.google.com would say, OK, you have an access token, but it doesn't mean that you can do just anything. Nate said you have access to maybe read-only access to the contacts. You can't go like delete them, or you can't go look at his location history and see where he's been or whatever. So this basically, this whole flow here, um, this, is, this is the whole thing. The entire rest of this talk, we're basically just going to be talking about slight variations or slight details of this flow. But this is the whole thing. So we're making some progress. I talked about how the, um, the access token basically grants access to the client to do a specific thing. But how does, how does the client specify what thing it wants to do? Well, we need some way of being able to say, well, the client wants to do like read my contacts, but isn't trying to get access to delete my contacts. It wouldn't be very useful if it was like a black or white, all or nothing thing. We don't want to have like no permission or every permission. We want to have some way of being like very granular, have specific permissions that we can turn on or off or request. And to add a little bit more terminology to it, that is what OAuth calls this idea of scope or scopes. The way this works is the authorization server has a list of scopes that it understands. So it might be like contacts.read, contacts.write, um, you know, email.read, email.delete, basically any type of permissions that make sense in the system. And then the client application, when they kick off this flow, they say, okay, I don't care about most of those scopes. I don't need to read his email or delete his search history or whatever. I just want the scope that gives me access just to read his contacts, and that's it. Or if they need to do more stuff, they could request multiple scopes, depending on whatever level of permissions they need to have with my data. And then on the flip side of that, that list of scopes, that list of permissions that the client is asking for is then used by the authorization server to generate that, that screen, that consent screen that is presented to the user that says, hey, Yelp is asking for permission to do X, Y, Z, A, B, C. Are you sure you want to allow this? And the user is given explicit, uh, the explicit ability to consent or not consent to that particular level of access or that particular list of scopes. Um, in, in the case of Facebook, they've, they changed their authorization server recently to um, be really explicit about letting you know whether or not an app that you're giving access to is allowed to post to your wall. Because early on, um, it wasn't really clear. It was like, do you want to let this app connect to your account, yes or no? And if you click yes, you weren't really sure, does that just mean they get my info? Or does that mean they like, get to spam my wall? So because that was really annoying and people got really upset about that, Facebook made that much more explicit and granular. So you have to, if you're an application connecting to Facebook, if you're a client, you have to say, I do specifically want the scope that lets me post to their wall or not. And then in the consent screen, it's made really clear to you, which is nice. Um, so let's look at this diagram one more time. 
Not much changed here except at the beginning, the, uh, the initial request over to the authorization server, the client specifically enumerates all the, scope, uh, all the scopes separated by spaces that they need to have against the user or for the user. In this case, let's say that this, the Yelp application just wants to access my public profile and my contacts. I'm simplifying it just a little bit here because Google scopes tend to be like really long URL strings, um, but this, this, this is the general idea. So what's going to happen here is because the client requested scope, profile, and contacts, that's what's used to build this consent screen. And then after the, uh, after the whole flow completes and the client exchanges that authorization code for an access token and then uses that access token to go call some API, um, that access token itself is limited or scoped to exactly what scopes were requested at the beginning. So this access token, in other words, that, that comes out of this flow is specifically scoped to profile contacts. That's it. That means that Yelp, the Yelp application couldn't turn around and then go send some other API request to like, you know, the Google Calendar API or a, a delete request to my contacts or whatever because it, the access token, even though it's valid, is not scoped to do those particular things. All right. Any questions so far? We've gotten through quite a bit of the terminology. Great question. So the question was, how, why do we have these two things? Why do we have to get an authorization code and then exchange that for the access token? Why don't we just use the code? Or why don't we just get the access token immediately? Why is there that extra step? It's a great question. I swear I didn't plant you in the audience because that sets me up perfectly for what I need to talk about next. Um, so that's a great question. There's a specific reason why we need to do this extra step, why we get a code instead of just getting the token right away. Um, and it, I'm hinting at it here with uh, some of these lines being solid and some of these lines being dashed. Um, but we need to talk about what it means to have a back channel and a front channel. So this isn't specifically OAuth terminology. This is more like network security terminology. Um, but we have this idea in networking of having a back channel or what's considered a highly secure communication channel and a front channel, which is a secure but slightly less secure channel. I'll explain what I mean. So when, uh, let's talk about a highly secure channel. Well, if I have my server code running on my server, which only I have access to, and I make an API request or some, some, some HTTP request from my server to another server, like Google's API, for example, and that's going over you know, HTTPS, it's uh, SSL encrypted, no one can intercept that communication, it's highly secure. That would be considered what you would call a back channel going from my, my backend server to some other API or some other, some other system. A front channel, on the other hand, is something like your browser, where your browser is secure, but there's some, because of how browsers are built, there's some loopholes or there's some, some places where stuff could leak from the browser. What I mean by that is, let's imagine that if I'm building a website or I'm building a web application, I, and I want to keep like a, a secret password or a secret key or something in my web application. If I put it in the HTML or JavaScript of my web app, technically somebody could just right click, view source, look through my raw code and see it there, right? If they really wanted to go digging. Or they could open up like the net network console or the Chrome developer tools and, and see what my JavaScript is doing, change potentially what's happening on my page. So because of things like that, or simply someone could be looking over my shoulder and see something that's on the page. Because of that, browsers are considered to be a front channel. In other words, we can trust the browser, but we only like trust it as far as we can throw it, not, not complete trust. We have complete trust in the code that's running on our own server, but not complete trust in the browser. So as you'll see here, we're going to go through this flow one more time. As you'll see here, the way this flow is designed including the reason why we have to get an authorization code and then exchange it for a token, is designed to take advantage of the best things about the front channel and the best things about the back channel to make sure it's highly secure. I'll explain what I mean. So let's say that we have a, the client, which is going over to the authorization server. We've gone through this before. All of these things are happening on the front channel. What I mean by that is all of these are just full page redirects in the browser. Um, we have like on the outgoing request here, we have the redirect over to the authorization server. 
The stuff that we're passing along to the authorization server, the redirect URI, what response type we want, all the scopes we want, those are all being passed through the browser. This is usually just in like the query, query parameters, query parameters of the uh, of the request. So technically, if someone was like looking over your shoulder, if you're looking at the address bar in your browser, you can see this stuff. It's not like secret. Um, but that turns out that's okay because if somebody sees the scopes that we're asking for, eh, who cares? If somebody sees what redirect URI we're going back to at the end, who cares? Because we're going to go there anyway. It's not like that's a secret. Um, if you notice, coming back from the authorization server back to the client, that is also happening on a front channel. I've made all the front channel requests to solid lines here. Um, that means that the authorization code is also transmitted through the browser, through the front channel. That means that that's usually also in the query parameters of the request. So if you really look, if you squint as the requests are happening in your browser, you can see the code uh, in the query parameters of the address bar. So that means the authorization code comes back to the, the redirect URI, to the callback, over the browser. The next step, though, happens on a back channel. So the reason, that, uh, the reason we do it that way is because let's say that somebody was intercepting your browser request, or maybe they had a, you accidentally installed a malicious toolbar like, or something like that in your browser, and it was watching your network requests. Well, someone who had, had the, um, who could like log Work requests would be able to see the code as it came across the browser because it's just going to be like slash callback question mark code equals something. Technically, they could maybe steal the code, grab it themselves, and then try to beat you to the exchange and try to get your access token before you could, right? But it turns out they can't do that because the, the exchange happens only on the back channel. It doesn't happen on the front channel. So that token exchange happens when you, the application, the client grabs that code then makes a, a back channel request from the back end server code to back to the authorization server, but that does not happen through the, through the browser. Um, and again, that is for security. So we're post, usually it's an HTTP post, we're posting that authorization code up to the authorization server, along with some other information like a secret key that only the server knows. So that means that even if someone stole the authorization code, they wouldn't be able to make that exchange request and, and try to grab your access token before, like, before you could because they don't have that secret key. And the reason this is on the back channel is because we don't ever want that secret key to be in the browser. Because if it, if it was transmitted in the browser, we don't know if someone could have stolen it. So we do that only on the back channel on a system we can trust, basically our own server code. And the communication with the resource server using the access token is usually also don't, done only on the back channel. Because once the application has an access token, the access token is typically, typically considered to be like sensitive information. I, if I transmit the access token to the browser, someone could technically steal it. And then they would be able to do whatever they wanted with that access token, whatever it's scoped for, um, as much as they wanted. So that part is also done on the back channel. So I said at the beginning that this flow is designed to kind of take advantage of the best, the best things about the front channel and the best things about the back channel. What I mean by that is the front channel here is used to interact with the user. So the browser is used to interact with the user, present them the login screen, present them the consent screen, all that good stuff. That's what a browser is really good at. But because we can't completely trust the browser with like secret keys and stuff like that, we let the, the, the last step of the flow, the exchange, happen on the back channel where it's a system that we trust. Question. So that means Elf has already done something before with Google to get that secret. Yes. You didn't explain that. Before. Yes, exactly. So the question was, does that mean that that we had to do something initially to set up with Google to get that that secret and that key? Absolutely. So let's take a look now. We've done. We've looked at this um, this diagram quite a bit. This is helpful to like understand how it works at a high level. But let's look at a little bit more like raw how this actually works. And I'll, I'll definitely answer that question as well. So. If you were to look at the, the, the link or the button that you click on that says like connect with Google or link to your Google account, this is actually where that would be going to. This is what your browser gets redirected to. It's an, uh, an address on the authorization server um, that you then pass a number of parameters to or some configuration to. So I talked about some of these already, the redirect URI, what scopes you want, what response, something that you set up one time with the authorization server, with Google in this case. And then we usually pass along something called a state, which is just uh, like a text value that gets sent over and then comes back at the end. 
But let me um, show you, I'm going to switch, switch gears here for one second. I'm going to show you what it looks like to set up one of these. Um, there we go. So let's say that I wanted to, I'm building the next Yelp, and I want to make this work. I want to be able to have people authorize their Google account, and so I can get access to their contacts. What I would have to do is I would have to do a one-time setup step where I go into Google, I go to the authorization server, and I say, I'm going to create a client. And by creating a client, I get two things. I get something called a client ID, which is actually this value that you can see right here. It's kind of a long, a long string, um, the whole thing. And I also get something called a client secret, which isn't shown here because it's a, a really like, sensitive piece of data. So with that client ID and client secret, that's, that was what identifies me to the authorization server. So the client ID is passed along with the initial request, which is on the front channel because the client ID is not sensitive. It just identifies the Yelp application. The client secret, on the other hand, is basically like my secret key. This is what I use in the back channel request during the token exchange step. And I'll show you how that works in just a sec. Um, what I want to do is I want to show you how this kind of how this looks in the real world. So let's say that I wanted to test this out. I because it can be pretty difficult to um, to kind of get this working the first time because you have to make sure you have all the parameters set correctly and stuff. I I'm on I'm not on Wi-Fi apparently. Um, I created a tool called OAuthDebugger.com, which just makes it a little bit easier to test these things and see what's happening. Um, one sec. Which isn't working right now. Could be because I'm on the wrong Wi-Fi. Let me just double check this. Or it's because I'm giving a demo and the demo gods said, not today. OK, so it's my Wi-Fi. Oh, cool. Let me try the Ethernet instead. Secure, secured. Perfect. Thank you. It was the Wi-Fi. Thank you very much. Um, so where was I? So I built a tool called OAuth Debugger. You can try it out at OAuthDebugger.com. It basically just makes it easy to set up the request and then see if it worked. And then once you know it works, then you can like, take the debugger out of the loop and put your real application in there, and it, everything should work. So I'm just going to use this to demo what it looks like to make a request against Google and see what happens. So this basically just in from Google, from the, the console. I'm going to request the scope profile, which just gives me basic access to the um, user's profile information. So far, which is response type code, meaning I'll get an authorization code back from the authorization server. And let's just give this a try, see what happens. It's going to ask me to log in. Notice my URL here is accounts.google.com, so we're over on the authorization server. I'm going to log in. Since I logged in recently, it's probably not going to ask me to do my password. And OK. So we came back. This, um, because the redirect URI that I specified here temporarily was my debugging tool, it came back to my debugger. And you can see, actually, here, if you squint, you can see the authorization code here in the, in the address bar. Or you can just see it right here. So this is the authorization code we got back from Google. Like I said, this isn't very useful except to do the next step, which is to exchange it for an access token. Now, you can't do that through my tool here because um, that would require sharing your client secret with my tool, and you shouldn't do that with anybody, even if you trust me. Um, but I'll show you what that next step looks like. Get my slides back up. All right. OK, so this is basically what we just did. Assume if the user um, if the user clicked no, I do not consent to this, or maybe you didn't set up the parameters correctly, something went wrong. Um, you'll get the authorization server will redirect back to you with an error, 
but we did it all correctly, and I clicked yes. So we got back a code, which is what we asked for at the beginning. Now, the next step, like I said, is exchanging that, that code for an access token. So what that would look like, is, oops, that's the wrong way. What that would look like is a HTTP post to the authorization server on a different route called the token endpoint or the token route. And basically, we just send along a request that has the code that we just got, our client ID. This time, we also include the client secret, which is that kind of really sensitive bit of data, the secret key that we should only keep on the server. And then we just say, hey, authorization server, I just got this code, but I really want a token. Please give it to me. And assuming that the token, the code wasn't like made up or forged or something, that's exactly what you would get back. You would get back a response that says, here's your access token. It's good for this many seconds, maybe like five minutes or an hour or five hours or whatever makes sense. Um, and then the client finally has what, they, what it wants, what it needs, which is an, uh, an access token that can be used to make a request. So that request might look something like this. Maybe we go call some other API or some other system. We attach the HTTP authorization header to the request. And we say bearer and then the access token itself. Because, um, because of that, sometimes access tokens are called bearer tokens. Um, and all that's, all that's really doing is just saying, OK, the client's making a request to, the, uh, to some system, to some API, including that token in the request. And then it's up to that downstream API to say, OK, I need to make sure this token is valid. They didn't just invent this token, they didn't make it up, um, it hasn't expired, and it actually does have the scope to do what they're trying to do. So if this request was like, you know, delete contacts, hopefully that API would reject it, even though the access token was valid. Um, but assuming all the checks, all the validation works out, then basically the request is approved, is, is succeeds, and then the client holds on to that access token, and if they need to make another request, they just attach it to the next request and keep going like that. Um, so I mentioned that there are a couple of different OAuth flows or a, a couple of different OAuth grant types. We've just been talking about this authorization code flow or this authorization code grant type where you get a code back. That's why it's called that. Um, and that uses both the front channel and the back channel together to kind of make a really highly secure um, method of exchanging this information. There are some other ways to do it though. Um, there's something called the implicit flow. If for some reason you don't have a back channel, you only have a front channel, then you can do what you mentioned earlier, which is skip that exchange step. Just give me the token right back from the authorization server. Don't give me a code. Just give me the token instead. And that's used sometimes when you have situations, like I said, where you don't have a front, uh, you don't have a back channel. You only have a front channel. And that sometimes happens when, say, you have a pure JavaScript app, like a pure React or a pure Angular app that has no backend. It maybe has some backend API that it's calling, but it doesn't have a backend server that's actually like rendering the page and has the ability to run some backend code. So in that case, if you have like a static single page app written in JavaScript, you don't have a back channel. So the only thing you can do is do this all in the front channel. Um, I'll show you an example of that in just one sec, but I wanted to cover the other two flows that are sometimes used. Um, there's one called the resource owner password flow or the resource owner password credentials flow. It's quite a mouthful. Um, and there's something called the client credentials flow. Those two flows are back, back channel only. So they don't involve the user's browser at all. This is basically just your code, your backend server code, posting a, a message to the authorization server and saying, hey, I've got these credentials. Just give me an access token right away. Um, they're, not, they're not as commonly used as the first two. Um, the client credentials flow is sometimes used when you're doing like machine to machine or service uh, communication. And the resource owner password flow is sometimes used to like kind of like make older, older applications work correctly, um, but it's not the like recommended approach for new applications. I can talk about, about that more if you want uh, a little bit later, but I wanna show you an example of the implicit flow, which is again, front channel only. If we don't have access to a back channel, this is what we have to do. Ideally, if we have a back channel, we should just use the back channel and use the authorization code flow, which is what you would do in most web apps and mobile apps. But if you're in like a single page app, you don't have access to that, what you can do is, you'll notice all these are solid lines, go over to the authorization server. Instead of response type code, we're saying response type token, which means give me that access token immediately. Don't give me a code that I have to exchange. Which means that coming back from the authorization server, we just get the access token right away. We don't, we don't have to do that exchange step. And then we can go talk to a resource server with that access token, all entirely on the front channel. So, like I mentioned before, 
this is considered to be a little bit less secure because you don't have that additional assurance that the exchange step happened on a back channel. You don't have an assurance that the token is not exposed to the browser because obviously the token is directly exposed to the browser. Um, and that's okay if you're doing, um, if you have a single page app, this is sometimes the only way to do it. Um, and it can make sense in some situations. You just have to be aware of, of the security trade-offs you're making and you have to make sure that there's no way for the token to be stolen from your app, which is just good, good security in general. All right, I think we have a question here. Oh, it looks like it was already answered. If, if you do have a question on the, on the um, webcast, you can just enter it in and I'll get back to it. All right, so let's revisit our time machine, but we're gonna fast forward a couple of years. So we were in like 2006 or so, we looked at how the OAuth protocol was invented to solve this delegated authorization problem where I just need to like, basically exchanging permissions between systems across the internet. Well, if we fast forward a couple of years, the, the OAuth 2.0 protocol got adopted like, like gangbusters. It was like very popular for solving this problem, which is awesome, because a ton of people adopted it. It became like a really well-used standard on the internet. The problem was it became a like too, too, <laughs> too used standard on the internet. It, it kind of became a victim of its own success in a way. It wasn't, people started to use it not just for the delegated authorization problem, but also for all these other use cases like mobile apps and sim just simple web login and single sign on and all this other stuff. Does anybody remember when the Facebook login button first came out? It was like 2009 maybe, but before, before the Facebook login button, the idea that you could log into a site with like just your Facebook or, or Google existing like social credentials wasn't a thing. It was kind of a new idea. I think it was like 2009, 2010. Um, well, if you look under the hood, the way that Facebook kind of built that blue login with Facebook button and, or Google built the login with Google button that's like kind of ubiquitous across the web now is they just used OAuth. That just uses OAuth under the hood because they said, hey, OAuth, is really popular, it, do, it solves these use cases really well, and why don't we just use it for this authentication use case as well? So we end up in this situation where OAuth is being used for authorization, which it was originally built for, and also being used for all these authentication use cases as well. And unfortunately, OAuth was never designed to be used for authentication. Um, and I know that sounds kind of like maybe I'm splitting hairs, it's a bit of an, like an academic difference, but there's actually a big difference and there's reasons why you shouldn't use OAuth for authentication. Um, this happens to be why it tends to be so confusing to read about OAuth online. Because if you just hit a random site talking about OAuth, half the time they're talking about using OAuth for authorization, for permissions, which is originally what it was for. And half the time they're talking about using it for authentication, which in my opinion is a bit of a hack. It's um, not what the protocol is for. So let me, let me explain why. Using OAuth for authentication is bad because in OAuth, there's no standard way of getting the user's information. So if you think about, let's say that I'm a website and you just logged in, I probably want to know at least a little bit of information about you, like maybe what's your email address, what's your name, who just logged in, that would be useful to have. Well, OAuth was designed for permissions, scopes. It cares about like, is your access token scoped to a particular thing? It doesn't really care who you are. So there is no way in the OAuth protocol to get the user's information. Um, so, that means that when Facebook built the Facebook login button and Google built the Google login button and Twitter and Microsoft and LinkedIn, everybody built these social login buttons and they used OAuth under the hood for it, they all had to add their own like kind of custom hacks on top of OAuth to make some way of being able to get the user's info and some other, some other things that OAuth is just kind of missing. Um, which is again why it's sometimes so confusing to read about this online. All of these implementations ended up being just a little bit different. They're not really quite in interoperable. Um, this is bad. When we have a standard, we hopefully want it to be like super interoperable and, and used the same way everywhere. Um, so because of this problem, because of the kind of OAuth being overused for this authentication use case, um, some really smart people kind of went back to the drawing board and they said, okay, OAuth works really well. It solves this delegated authorization problem really well. Now a bunch of people are using it for authentication. Not great. They're all doing their own weird hacks on top of it to make it work. Thanks, Google and Facebook. Why don't we try to add just a little bit, whatever OAuth is missing for that authentication use case, why don't we just add a little extension on top of OAuth to make it work for that authentication use case as well? Because it's pretty close, it's just not quite all the way there. So out of that effort came this protocol called OpenID Connect. And it's actually not even fair to call OpenID Connect a separate protocol. It's really just a, 
5, 10% layer on top of OAuth 2.0 that says, hey, if you're using OAuth for these authentication use cases, just do this other extra stuff, and that's it. So OpenID Connect isn't really new, it's just a, an extension to OAuth 2.0. Specifically, what OpenID Connect adds to OAuth 2.0 to solve these problems or kind of close the gap for this authentication use case is something called an ID token. And that ID token is exactly what it sounds like. It just has some of the user's information. It represents the ID or the information about the user. And it, if, if for some reason the ID token you get back from the authorization server doesn't have all of the information you want, you can also request more user information from something called the user info endpoint, which all OpenID Connect um, uh, which all OpenID Connect authorization servers uh, implement. So basically what this means is that if I'm using an author, if I'm talking to an authorization server that understands OpenID Connect, not only do I get to act, ask for an access token, but I can also ask for an ID token. And that's literally basically the only difference between OAuth and OpenID Connect, or the only thing OpenID Connect adds. It adds some other really nice to have stuff like the, the way the spec is implemented is a little bit more standardized and, and that's kind of nice stuff to make it easier to use. But let's take a look at what it might look to do an OpenID Connect flow. This is going to look really, really familiar because it's, without trying to drive the point home too many times, it's exactly the same thing. The only difference, if you squint and look really closely at the very beginning of the flow, notice how we're still asking for the profile scope, but now we're also asking for this other scope called OpenID. And that is the only, like, on the technical level, that's the only thing that, I, that means that this is an OpenID Connect request rather than an OAuth request. It is, in, if you want to be really technical about it, it is both an OpenID Connect request and an OAuth request. We're just using OAuth to do OpenID Connect. So what asking for that OpenID scope means is that when we go over to the authorization server, all the normal stuff happens. We get asked to allow you know, access to your public profile or whatever. Um, we get back to the callback with an authorization code, we exchange that code for an access token, but we also get back an ID token, so we get back both. And the ID token can be like immediately consumed by the application to understand, or decoded by the application to understand who the user is that just logged in. So we've kind of closed the gap for doing authentication, not just authorization. Um, and then the access token that we get back as the client application can then be used if we need more information about the user, we can go then call um, the user info endpoint to get even more info about the user using that access token. So I want to give you a quick demo of this. I have an authorization server um, that is OpenID Connect compatible running, um, running via Okta up in the cloud. So I'm going to use my, the other version of the tool I built called OpenID Connect Debugger to go ahead and try a request against that. Um, if you notice, the only, the only thing that, like I said, the only thing that identifies this as an OpenID Connect request is this OpenID scope, that's it. So I'm gonna construct this request. I'm actually gonna, instead of asking for a code like I've been doing so far, I'm gonna ask for an ID token. So this is actually the implicit flow in the sense that we are not gonna get the code, we're gonna get the token immediately back from the authorization and I want to do that just so you can see what that ID token looks like. So when I redirect over to this uh, authorization server that I built using Okta, uh, I'm going to get asked to log in, ask a security question, and all right. So we get an ID token back because that's what we asked for at the beginning. And the ID token is this long string of gibberish. It's actually very specific gibberish, but it looks like gibberish. Um, the ID token is something called a JSON web token or a JWT, sometimes pronounced as a JOT. Um, and that's just a standard way of encoding a bunch of information in a, in a way that's easy to transmit over the internet. If I actually copy this ID token, just hit on here, and then go to a tool that can decode it like JSONWebToken.io, just paste that in here, and you can actually see what what information is inside of this ID token. So it has a bunch of different properties in here. Basically just a bunch of information about me, the user. So like my user ID or my email address, things like that. Let me switch back to my slides here. 
Okay, so the, the ID token that you just saw kind of looks like this. I highlighted some different segments or different chunks of that ID token. But if you decode it, if you put it through the decoder that I just showed you, um, you get something that looks like this. There's a header portion, there's a payload portion, which is sometimes called claims, and you get a, there's also a signature portion as well. The, the claims is what can be decoded by your application to understand who just logged in, user information, when the token expires, when they logged in, all that good stuff. Kind of just basic information about the user. And then the signature is also really important because um, the signature can be used to verify that the ID token hasn't been uh, modified or, or compromised or, or rather changed in any way in flight. So the client application can actually take that signature, do some crypto math on it, and say, okay, I, I know that this ID token has been stamped by this authorization server. It's still authentic. It hasn't been modified. Someone didn't forge it. Nate didn't go in and try to edit and say that he was somebody else or whatever. So that's a really cool feature of the JSON web token or JWT um, standard. Header, payloads, claim, and signature. So like I said, the, the ID token, because of that signature, it can be kind of independently verified by the application without even necessarily having to go back and talk to the authorization server. Um, also, like I mentioned before, I could use the access token I get back to go call that user info endpoint. If, if the information in the ID token wasn't quite everything I wanted to know about the user, I can just go to the call the user info endpoint, say, hey, I want information about this user. Here's the access token that proves that I am allowed to have this user's info, and I get even more info about the user. Sometimes this is like additional stuff like their profile picture or things like that. All right, so let's revisit our time machine one more time. Now we're all the way fast forwarded up to today. Um, we have OAuth 2.0 still being used for those delegated permissions, delegated authorization use cases. That's correct. And now we're also using the correct tool for authentication use cases too. So mobile apps for single sign-on or for some like you know, just simple login cases, we can use OpenID Connect instead of misusing OAuth 2.0 for that stuff. And just to be a little bit even more specific, we would use OAuth we're dealing with permissions and authorization, we would use OpenID Connect whenever we're dealing with authentication. Sometimes some people get confused and think that because OpenID Connect is like newer, then it, it replaces OAuth 2.0 or it's better than or whatever, but it's not, it's not like that at all. The, there are different tools for different jobs. The only thing that OpenID Connect replaces is misusing OAuth for authentication. We should definitely not do that anymore. But for still doing like permissions and delegated authorization, OAuth 2.0 is the right tool for the job. All right, so let's take a look at a couple of like practical examples. We're almost out of time here. Um, I want to show a couple of practical examples of like what uh, OAuth flows or OpenID Connect flows should be used for particular use cases because this tends to come up a lot. There's some complexity in the spec about like what flow is used in what sh what situation and stuff like that. But I'm just going to really briefly go through some of these. So let's. Let's imagine that we have a really like a basic web application. We just want users to be able to log in. This is kind of revisiting that simple login case that I showed right at the beginning. At the very beginning, we talked about a simple website that just had like a form with an email and password field, and it was just hitting the database or something to look up the user's info. If we um, if we re-implemented that with OpenID Connect, what we would do is use the authorization code flow to go over to an authorization server maybe run by Google, maybe run by Okta, maybe run one that you made yourself or whatever, um, but use the authorization server to handle the login stuff. And all the application needs to worry about is it knows it's going to get an access token and an ID token back from the authorization server. And then just like at the very beginning example, it's probably going to just drop like a session token or a session, uh, session cookie rather uh, into, the, into the browser to keep track of the user. And then on the back end, it's just going to hold on to the user's access token and ID token while they're logged in. Um, the benefit that this has over the kind of very simple forms authentication I showed at the very beginning is that now the authentication system and the rest of the app are kind of a little abstracted. They have a little bit of separation there. What makes that nice is that then the app and the authentication system can kind of evolve separately if they need to. We can do maintenance on the authentication system and update it if stuff needs to change, security holes need to be closed, all that good stuff. OpenID Connect is just kind of the glue that keeps them tied together in, in a standard protocol way, which is really nice. This looks almost identical for native mobile apps. So if you have a, a native app on iOS or Android, nobody really uses Windows Phone anymore, but technically that too, um, you would do the same exact thing. You would use the OpenID Connect uh, authorization code flow plus one extra more little extension called 
PKCE, proof code for key exchange, sometimes called Pixie, um, to just do the same thing. Get a access token, get an ID token, save those on the device, usually store them behind the you know, keychain or um, behind touch ID or whatever. Use the ID token to understand who the user is. Use an access token to authorize API calls, all that good stuff. Um, the, what's really, really nice about mobile is that all of the stuff involving going to talk to the authorization server, making sure you use the right flow, making sure you do Pixie, making sure that you do this correctly on each different, like there's some, some differences between different mobile operating systems, like on Android you're supposed to use a specific tab browser control, or maybe that's changed now, something like that. On, on iOS you have to use the Safari view controller, all that stuff is all abstracted away in this library that Google and some other folks worked on called AppAuth. So you can basically just use AppAuth and it does all this for you. All, all good. Um, the other example I talked about was a single page app with an API backend. This is a situation where you don't have a back channel, so you have to use the implicit flow. Otherwise, it's identical. You're getting tokens back from the authorization server, and you're storing those locally in your app somehow, taking some care to make sure that you don't, um, uh, to make sure that those tokens can't be leaked in any way. So you need to make sure you're not, don't have any uh, XSS in your JavaScript and stuff, but that's a little bit outside of the scope of this talk. Um, there's also some other cool stuff you can do. This is also outside of the scope of this talk, but you can do like, um, you can use a, a, a authorization server like Okta to provide a bridge to older protocols like SAML or other things that you don't really want to deal with in your app. So your app only has to focus on OpenID Connect, and then you let the authorization server handle all the, the grunt work of dealing with a protocol like SAML, which is kind of cool. Um, but that's all I have for today. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise, you're free to take off. I got a couple more resources for you. If you want to dig even further into how these protocols work, especially how OAuth works, hit up OAuth.com. We have a free ebook that we've published there that goes into like a ton of detail about how it works even more than I got into today. And talks about stuff like token, like expiry and revocation and validation and all that stuff that I didn't really have time to go into. Um, and if you just want to play around with it, if you want to get spin up your own authorization server in the cloud, totally free, you can go to developer.octa.com, register for an account, create as many authorization servers as you want, play around with them for uh, totally free, super easy, super cool. So thank you so much for your time. I'll leave it open for a couple more questions, um, but otherwise, have a great day.